Hello and welcome to Box Office Culture. Today on Box Office Culture, we are talking about the thing we talk about most. You guessed it, movies. It is May and summer is upon us. So on today's show, we're talking about summer movies. We're talking about some of the big summer movies coming out this year. And we're talking about the idea of summer movies in general and what makes a good summer movie, a good summer blockbuster. What kind of movies do you want to see in the summer? What are the best summers in movie history? So that's what we're talking about today after this. Okay, joining me as always, co-host, I'm going to call you co-host every time, Lee Metzger. Welcome. Oh, hello. It's me, Lee. Producer Lee, back at my desk. You might recognize this from the load-in, but uh, what you are seeing now is this is an office with uh, me and Tony in it. This is our actual office. This is not a set. I know it looks grand and amazing and like we spent a lot of money on production design, but this is real life, folks. Yeah, no, the, none of this, none of the stuff in here is expensive. It's all <laughs> trash. It's all found. You know, when you go to like a dump, a, uh, <laughs> you want to go to a dumpster, you know, when you go to like uh, the transfer station or something, a, a dump, you see like all the, like there's a place, like a little shed where people just like leave old dishes and like, and like uh, silverware. That's where we found all this stuff. I feel like that's a dirt shed. A dig to the the actual pile of silverware I have under my desk over here. Yeah, it it's, looks great. I, I think know you've been a little tarnished. He's been telling me for weeks. A little to get elbow rid of this. grease. Yeah. All right. Well, Lee, we're talking about summer movies. Last week we talked about Planet of the Apes ahead of Kingdom oh, of the Planet of the Apes releasing. Um, technically not a summer movie summer movies generally start around memorial day you could argue for early may uh as summer movie season but we're we're gonna start with what's coming out next week our summer movie conversation begins on may 24th um but i do want to say kingdom of the planet of the apes and the fall guy with ryan gosling and emily blunt those are two pretty solid lead-ups to the summer movie season that are playing right now um And, you know, I'm not going to talk in great detail about those movies, but I think either of those would be a great contender for what makes a a good summer movie. They just didn't they didn't time it right. Well, depending on what your your um, definition of a summer movie. So what is a summer blockbuster? So the the obvious definition is a movie that comes out in summer. A summer movie is something released between Memorial Day and Labor Day. That's the general consensus of what makes a summer movie or defines the summer movie season. Uh, But summer movies have garnered their own kind of definition over time. Um, I would say since the late seventies and that's when studios release these really big tentpole, exciting blockbuster popcorn movies um and the summer movie season has been dominated by that ever since um i was thinking ahead of this conversation like what what memorable summer movie years really meant something to me or do i you know stand out to me in my past um for me 1996 was the one that was kind of clear because that's the year independence day came out Mm. And that was the perfect age for that movie when it came out. You know, I was a kid. It was this big, expensive, over-the-top science fiction film. It's called freaking Independence Day, and it came out around the 4th of July. Um, You don't get more summer than that. And Will Smith at the time was, like, the biggest movie star in the world. Um, You know, and it was a big, huge event movie. Everywhere you saw everything, Independence Day, every store, Suncoast, video remember suncoast video do you remember this store okay i'm older than you but like i would go to suncoast video at the mall and buy the independence day posters and it was a big deal back then also the product placement for these summer blockbusters you know tv was you know we're in the streaming world now so tv is not what it was and the advertising we're all getting is so fractured but back then it was we're all getting the same advertising and summer movies really played into that so you you would see summer movie uh toys at mcdonald's and you know cups at burger king or you know coca-cola putting out phantom menace cans of every character uh, things like that um 
See, He's, that is my that's that's my summer blockbuster memory. The first it, one is like 1999, Phantom Menace, Obi Wan, friggin' Qui Gon Jinn, Padme, and like Darth Maul toys from all of these like um, fast food joints. Totally. Like that. That was that. I was I was nine years old. And I remember getting so friggin' jazz. I I feel like there was some there was some like princess um, Padme headdress cup, and I remember it because she her her I think it was like shoulders and head. I remember it because of how unwieldy it was. Yeah. Um, Where was it from? Do you, you I don't think remember? It was like it was McDonald's. It was some. It was okay. some fast food joint. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Maybe it was Sonic. That feels like a Sonic thing. Taco Bell Taco had Bell. a lot of Star Wars tie-ins, mm-hmm. I remember, because I would collect all of them. The tie-ins are huge, man. I, I remember, this is often a little bit of a tangent, but at one point, and this is probably th- th- probably the same thing happened in your house, do you remember collecting all the glass oh, yeah. McDonald's Which are highly jars? collectible right now. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with like the cups they would put out for the movies mm-hmm. or McDonald's Land characters. And it's not off topic. You said this seems like a tangent. It's not because you could argue that what has become and maybe is less so these days, but what became at its pinnacle, the thing about summer movies is the commercialization. Yeah. And these are like the big expensive movies and the big expensive marketing behind those movies. And the 90s was the probably the peak time for that kind of thing um because that's one of the marks of a quote-unquote summer blockbuster um i think it was was when did jaws come out 74 75 jaws yeah i don't know the exact year but yeah mid 70s in my in my research it all kind of points back to jaws as being like the first truly big um uh you know summer blockbuster in one of the one of the important parts of it being the marketing wing Mm -hmm. of it it was like the first thing that was like um you know late night uh talk show interviews um commercials uh during sports all the tie-ins in fast food like marketing was a huge aspect of what makes a a summer blockbuster weirdly not age specific targeting um which you know is less the case again these days but you'd have movies that just really were not that kid friendly and like toys coming out for those i remember like i had i'm pretty sure i had rambo action figures when i was a kid that is not that that is an r-rated film that is very violent and not good for kids to watch yeah and like jaws has people's head heads popping off it does and like limbs with like goo coming out of them yeah i I, it was a severed limbs the 80s and 90s were totally different um but i think the 90s definitely like were the peak that that 1999 year too that year in general for Mm. movies we should do a podcast on that sometime um that's just an amazing year for is that titanic for for movies no titanic i think came out in 97 um everybody came out in 97 Oh god! All right, moving on from Airbud talk. Didn't win any awards. 1982 though, though is, is biggest snubs. That's what we should do. We should do a show that's biggest snubs, and spoiler alert: a lot of them are gonna be Airbud. Yeah, yeah, no, maybe not. We could talk about it. Highly decorated in my house. Leave a comment if you want to hear such content on box office culture. They might break the link with crickets. how many comments. You hear those crickets? I hear. <laughs> Can't wait to read all these crickets. Um, 1982 is arguably everything you read when you, when you Google, like what's the biggest, best year for summer movies, 1982 always comes up. 82. 82 had E.T., um, which was the highest grossing film that year. It had Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, Blade Runner, The Thing, Conan, uh, The Barbarian, Poltergeist, um, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior. Heaters. You know, really amazing, timeless classic films. But, you know, the year I mentioned, 1996, you go back to 1996 and you look at that year, you have Independence Day and a bunch of garbage. Mm-hmm. Like, there were some terrible movies. 1993, I think, was the year Jurassic Park came out. And I'm pretty sure that movie came out in the summer. And I probably saw that movie eight times in theaters. That's the other the other thing that is, before we dive into, like, what movies are coming out this summer, the tragic thing for, for me as a, as a big film 
fan and and someone who grew up going to the movies so often um, and someone who works in a movie theater and and helps program films here um, it is discouraging that that world has kind of crumbled you know that that mass marketed say what you will about the mass commercialization of things um, just the hype train of movies and movie releases is has you know that that train is in the station and has been in the station for a while and that makes me sad because even going through this list we're about to go through I can pinpoint some of these movies that will have some tie-ins you know commercially and things like that um, but none of them are going to capture the attention and longevity of some of these movies in the 90s that you know like Independence Day would probably reign supreme in the theaters for two months um, a lot of these movies as great as they might be will play for two, three weeks and then die off to the next one. And that's that's a sad thing about the state of, of people in, in theatrical movie going. And I always champion that on this show and, and hope that it changes. But, you know, we'll see. What do you attribute that to? Is that like, because in my mind, I look at the, um, you know, when Jaws came out, it was the movie that they were promoting Mm -hmm. And then nowadays it kind of feels like the promotion, like the, the, the conversation begins with the promotion. So it's like, you know, the BB eight, um, the, the toys, the the tie-ins, like the Lego sets. It's true. Like it almost works backward from like what is most marketable Mm -hmm. and then finding a way to make a movie off of profits you know what i mean yeah i th- i mean that's part of it but i think the real thing that's hurting the the movie business especially the summer blockbuster movie business is that um streaming and and people's habits have changed we're all guilty of this i'm guilty of this myself um where sometimes it's easier just to say well I'll, it's going to be on streaming in a few weeks i'll just wait to see it there watch it on my couch um, yeah, and there are certain movies that that works for. There are certain movies that, yeah, fine, it makes sense. Watch it at home. It's a small movie. But the essence of the summer blockbuster, these are movies that are produced and made to be big, to be seen on the big screen. This is why Tom Cruise uh, came out and had this thing before Top Gun Maverick, which that also is one of the great summer blockbusters. Amazing movie, universal appeal, he came out in front of that movie at every screening on a video and said, you know, thank you for coming out to see this on the biggest screen possible. We created this to be seen on the biggest screen possible. This is why um, IMAX and Dolby and all of these companies doing film technology are, are touting these big releases. And this is also why I think there is a future, unfortunately, where there are less movies at this scale released theatrically, but they're bigger and they have a higher price point and they become more eventized. Um, but I, I just, I kind of miss the, just the big summer glut of movies and, um, yeah. So let's, let's, it's all doom and gloom, but there are some really exciting movies coming out that I'm excited to talk about. So let's, let's dive in. And I think the, the obvious place to start is the first week, uh, on May 24th, you have Furiosa. This is the prequel to Mad Max Fury Road that um, reviews just came out last night that I read. Uh, IndieWire said, arguably, possibly the best prequel ever made. Are you are you a fan of Fury Road, Lee? So, a uh, little peek behind the curtain. A couple days ago, I had a sick day. So, and I knew we had this podcast coming up. So I was like, I should, let's watch, let's watch a, let's watch a summer blockbuster. And I'm going through the list of things. And I'm like, top 10 summer blockbusters that you have to see. Um, I didn't watch any of those. But what I did boot up <laughs> was the first Mad Max. I'd never seen it. Okay. The first one. The first one. Which is maybe the worst one. I hated it. Yeah. I hated it. Because I, it's, it's not an established post-apocalyptic landscape at that point. No. I, and I, I was... I, I was trying to find my I was trying to find my footing. I was trying to get my bearings. And I was also trying to like make a connection between Mel Gibson in a cop car to um 
uh, to Charlize Theron um, running people off off the road in a gas tanker with with a metal arm, yeah, <laughs> and like and transporting milk, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, I had to turn that off. I couldn't. It, I I I think I got about like an yeah, hour into it, it. It feels like a different movie compared yeah. to because then you go uh, Road Warrior, Beyond Thunderdome, but then you have like like Fury Road. Fury Road is oh well, I think that the, being said the best. That being said, Fury Road, I, Fury Road was the first George Miller Mad Max movie I've ever seen. Okay, and it was incredible. Yeah, I loved it. I loved everything about it. The world been the world building was incredible. I loved the like spraying your teeth with like chrome. Yeah. Um. Uh. Just like everything was so heightened to a campy wild full place. immersion. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just there, there was no no part of it like I. I've often said my favorite movies are movies that have stupid premises, but they're played ex- like super seriously. That's why one of my favorite film series of all time is Fast and the Furious. Those movies are so stupid and ridiculous, but they are played so straight that it is it is just it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. That's how I felt about Fall Veritas, Guy. Cinema Veritas. I, Fast Fall- and the Furious movies are Cinema Veritas. <sighs> I mean, Fall Guy, I felt the same way. It's it. So these movies have a lot of camp in them. Mm. And I think the camp adds a comedy element, which lifts the film to a more relatable place. And, and Fury Road was was definitely that. Furiosa, the prequel, when I first saw the trailer for this, and now granted, neither of us have seen this film yet. Um, but when the trailer came out, I was, I'm still a little like, you should have still hired Charlize to play the earlier version because mm. Charlize looks incredible and could pull off the younger version, I think. Um, but they, they hired Anna Taylor joy. Um, and I was like, eh, I don't know. And then the trailer came out and it looked a lot like fury road. It looked a lot like fury road. And I thought maybe this is more of the same and I love fury road, but I, I, I wasn't getting it like a nice original piece out of that trailer. Well, apparently it's, freaking amazing and uh like 10 out of 10 reviews i've seen and so that's that's the start of the summer movie season and that's next week and i I, i'm dying to see i will be here friday night watching that movie that's i i'm interested in what you just said a, a minute ago about like the campiness of the movies um i think there's something I think there's something that happens to like an audience when you're watching a movie that is campy and played seriously because then it kind of feels safe for you to I don't know if disengage is the right word but like engage with it on a purely silly level mm-hmm. like if the people up on screen are being are doing silly things in a serious way then you are safe in enjoying that silliness. Well it's like a relatability so you a tentpole movie, which is like a big, you know, whether it's linked to sequels or prequels or pre-existing things or not, these big movies that studios are putting out, they have to have universal appeal. Mm -hmm. And in order to have universal appeal, you have to be able to laugh. You need to be able to feel for those characters in the movie. Um, And campiness and comedy is is obviously a really great way to do that. Um, I think a lot of these summer movies excel at that. It's it's stupid little one-liners, like even from the 90s, like Welcome to Earth, when Will Smith punches an alien in Independence Day. Um, these, these are moments that you pull out of these movies and they become a part of the zeitgeist of movie going and, you know, film as a whole. And those are the movies. I wrote an article years ago. I can't remember what it was for, but uh, I think I call it the Oscar Best Picture Fallacy. And I talked about how the Oscar Best Picture race is is always, in my mind, been not an accurate depiction of quote unquote best. Um, the best movie is the one that resonates with the most audiences, not necessarily the one that makes the most money, but the one that that lives on the longest, the one that you know three years later we're still talking about, not the one that won Best Picture that you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think summer movies sometimes can really encapsulate that because they they attract a little bit of everybody. Top Gun Maverick, again, going back to that one, universal appeal. We had all ages, all, you know, we had grandparents, like three generations of families going to see this movie together and enjoying it and coming back. Um, I feel like that one is, 
the, Maverick is a great movie to point to when you're talking about universal appeal mm -hmm. because in a, in the hyper politicized world that we live in right now everyone could go and see a movie about the military about the military complex and be like this shit rules um exactly yeah exactly. I, I thought they did a, a but that's what summer movies do i mean they bring people together they're a bridge what you were just talking about um i watched marcel the shell the movie last night and there's a line in that movie there's so many great lines in that movie, but there's a line where Marcel is talking about that really great feeling when you're having a party or you're at a party and you just disappear for a little while and you go and you hear everybody laughing and having fun, but you go to a, another room and just rest quietly for a minute. That is the same feeling that I get from going to these summer movies because you are in a theater with a group of people and you're enjoying the same moments together. You're feeling for the characters together. You're crying. You're laughing at the same points you know, you're on a literal journey together with a group of people and there's nothing better than that. You come out of that movie feeling, uh, you know, you're in a room of strangers, but you feel like a communal thing and you laugh and you say, oh my God, like that was so good. Or I can't believe that. I can't wait to go back. Or you you leave crying because it hits you in, in a weird space and you're like, why am I crying about a movie about jet fighters? And, you know, it's wild. Um, but that's the magic of it. So let's, Let's go back. We'll, we won't take too much time talking about each of these films, um, but let's go through some of the list and just give some hot takes on what we think, you know, how we think these films might do, what, what we think, you know, are they, do they look good to Speed us? Speed round. Speed round. So the other movie coming out on May 24th um, that will probably do really well is the first kids movie of the summer movie season. Also, I mean, that's an important thing. Uh, it's Garfield. It's a new Garfield movie uh, starring Chris Pratt as the voice of Garfield. And again, it's Chris Pratt, like Mario, doing his regular voice. Um, well, a little uninspired. My hot take on this is it's probably going to be way better than you think. Um, like you said, with Super Mario, mm -hmm. that mo I, I was so ready to watch that movie and be like, this sucks. This is commercial. It's so fun. And it was it ended up being really good. Mm -hmm. And I kind of liked Chris Pratt's voice. I I thought it, it worked. I thought he did it a good worked. job. He did the wahoo. He did. He did like like these these great moments and like yes, for sure. Whenever whenever a animated property makes the jump from wherever it lived before to a movie, I would prefer if the person who has originally done the voice for the that animated property to also make that jump that being said it could have been a lot worse chris pratt kind of pulled it off he did pull it off and you know like the garfield his voice matches what you expect from garfield like what i hear is like the 80s cartoon of garfield and it's just flat and mm -hmm. chris pratt can do that flat voice it looks fun i think it's gonna do well mm -hmm. um i do not think it's the most exciting of the kids movies coming out but We'll, we'll skip ahead then yes. to what probably is on June 14th. That's Inside Out 2. Um, Pixar, you know, Pixar sequels are, Disney animated sequels as well, are kind of like hit or miss sometimes. You don't know what you're going to get. You know, you get a, like Monsters University. Nah, doesn't really do it for me. But then you have like Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, Toy Story 4, Tear Jerkers. Amazing. Um, the Cars trailer. 2. Cars 2 was pretty good. I, didn't, I never liked any of the Cars films. I'm mm. sorry. It just, they didn't ever resonate with me for some reason. I don't know why. Finding Dory, I liked that, the Finding Nemo sequel. Um, but this, the trailer looked really funny. I like how they are going into the adolescence. Like, they're, it's not like a huge time jump. Um, it's middle school, which is so awkward for kids. Um, and it's about, you know, the, the insecurities and the anxieties. And I think it's going to be a very smart movie and it's going to talk to kind of a, a universal swath of, of kids about some of these feelings. Um, you know, anxiety is a huge feeling and a huge problem and a huge thing to grapple with at any age, we all know. Um, but at middle school, especially. So having a movie that's talking to that in a, a fun, clever, and um, respectful way, I think is that. I mean, that's what I see from this trailer. I think you're right. I, when it comes to things that Disney and Pixar do incredibly well, dealing with 
coming of age mm. bread and butter oh my god the toy story movies especially like mm-hmm. When Andy gives his toys away, I think it's Toy Story three. Yep. My God. Yep. Like tear up. I'm like I'm, I'm crying about toys in yeah. an animated film, and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm I'm I this has my full confidence. I think this is going to be a banger. I think this will be one of the highest grossing movies. I hope this outgrosses um, all of the kids' movies this year because I think quality wise, it's going to probably be the best. Mm-hmm. Um, the other kids movie, just to jump ahead, that's that's a big release is Despicable Me Four, uh, which comes out around Fourth of July, which is that's like clutch time to release a movie, um, and those movies always do so well, and they're fun enough, like it's fun to watch. Those movies, for me, have always felt super uninspired, um, and you, like I couldn't tell you the plot of one versus another right now. Um, whereas Inside Out 2 is, you know, that Pixar writing, that Pixar magic. Um, I really hope that movie elevates financially and does really well because I want them to keep making these movies. I'm sure it will. Uh, all right. We have Bike Riders, June 21st. Um, this movie looks dumb as hell. Yeah, lead is not into this movie. We, I don't think we're getting this movie now. Um, I think I've chosen some other things around it. Um, you know, I think it looks okay. It's uh, it, it's a good cast. It's you know, it's a good cast. Tom Hardy. I, it it's my opinion that movies like this are dumb, and we don't need to do them anymore because the I, machismo movie. Yeah, the like, yeah. uh, the tough guy, the tough guy's tough, and and he's big and strong, and he'll punch his way out. I'm like, we're good on that. He'll we pop or wheelie his way out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Watch this man. Oh, you, you're in trouble? Don't worry. I'm bringing my bike. I got I got my... We'll, we'll get the boys together on the bikes. You yeah. know what could solve this problem? Motorcycles, <laughs> and a lot of them. <laughs> Bicicletas. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested to see it, but... Well, nah. it's Austin Butler. It's Tom Hardy. It's a good... It's an interesting cast. Great cast. Um, All right. So the next movie is Kinds of Kindness, and I don't know a ton about this movie. All I know, it's it comes out in June. It's the next Yorgos Lanthimos movie. Uh, Poor Things was my favorite movie of last year. He, he makes some of the weirdest, most visionary movies of any director working right now. Um, so I'm excited to see anything he does. Emma Stone is starring. William Dafoe is in it. Great cast. Um, I'm just along for the ride for his films and I like to go into them with as little knowledge as possible because you really don't know what you're going to get. So that's coming out in June. Feels like he's just running it back. I can't believe he's releasing something like this big with this kind of cast this isn't he, quick. Isn't he just producing though? No, this is, I, I'm pretty sure he directed this. Okay. Yeah, this is, cool. this is his film. Um, June 28th. So there's this movie coming out. It's called Horizon, an American Saga, part one in June. Part two comes out in August. This is an interesting exercise. This is a, a Western epic uh, that Kevin Costner has made and stars in um, that is being released in two parts. I think this is the kind of movie that will end up doing really well. You know, people love Yellowstone. People love Westerns. Um, I think it's going to, I think financially it will do really well. It looks okay. Um, I love Westerns. I will go see it. Um, I don't love the tired tropes of Westerns. And I, I hope that we're beyond that, uh, especially in the depiction of, you know, native Americans and things like that. Um, but from what I've seen from the trailer so far, I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. So I have a faith and hope that, that Kevin Costner who, you know, dances with wolves was a really great movie when it came out. Um, you was can tell the last of Mohicans. No, that's, that's Daniel day Lewis, I think. Oh, okay. Um, but you know you can talk you can talk circles around dances with wolves about how it holds up and how it depicts things, um, but for when that movie came out, the depiction was actually something that nobody had really done. So I do have confidence that Kevin Costner will do this respectfully. But I think it's going to do well. Uh, all right, A Quiet Place, day one. This comes out in June. This is the prequel to A Quiet Place uh, that John Krasinski directed with him and Emily Blunt starring, which was a really great thrilling quiet spooky uh take on on horror i i liked a quiet place i didn't you know it didn't move the needle for me necessarily um this new one stars lupita Nyong'oya. it looks it, it actually looks pretty good it, it looks like there's a lot of monsters on screen it's not a lot of like hiding and you don't see many of the creatures um 
you know, I, it, it it has what a summer blockbuster should have. But it, I really liked the first Quiet Place. I thought it was it. It took like they. I, I feel like that movie came out, and then we got Bird Box, and then we got oh yeah, like um, there was a, this movie about like a blind guy, and people are like trapped in his house, and he's like killing them or something okay that happened like right after this like a lot of sensory movies yeah sensory horror yeah and and i thought that was kind of cool because then a couple of years later we had coda you know and well that's another thing about summer movies is that sometimes there's a theme of some like there's been years where like um you'll have two volcano movies come out you know. um what is it armageddon Oh yeah, Armageddon and the Day After Tomorrow, mm-hmm. two two meteor comet movies. I don't think it was the Day After Tomorrow. Day After Tomorrow came out in like the twenty, uh, oh late two thousands. But it was, it was something Deep no, Impact. Deep Impact. That was it. And then there's a year where Volcano came out and Dante's Peak. Yeah, and it like that stuff happens. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of that, this is a good segue talking about natural disasters. Uh, a movie that is coming out in July that I think is going to do really well. And I, I, we saw the trailer on the big screen, and we were like, oh, yeah, there's, like, fire tornadoes yeah, in this I'm movie. In. This is Twisters. This is the long-coming sequel to the film, Twister. Speaking of, Kevin Costner? No. He was in the first one, wasn't he? No, it was, um, oh, God, who was it? Uh, oh, Pullman or Paxton? Yeah, Pullman. Pullman? One of them. One of, one Pullman of the or bills. Paxton. I think it was Pullman. Um I Twister is it's a goofy movie. It's stupid, but it's entertaining as hell. And I'll I I rewatch it frequently. Um, and this movie looks like it's the same. It's like you know cowboys going after tornadoes and it's the hot perfect shots. like uh, yeah uh, uh, throw caution into the wind cowboy meets slick city scientist exactly and they <laughs> have to um, overcome their differences. We're gonna capture the rhythm of this tornado and it's going to be tense and it's going to We gonna... can't get close enough. Hold on tight, Missy. Have you ever seen that before and it's a it's a freaking fire tornado and yeah. you know, ca- I'm sure there will be at least one cow mm-hmm. flying by the screen. It could be the this, same cow. Twisters it, I I would say from this entire list of films, Twisters feels like the most summer blockbustery uh crop. At least like the a throwback to it feels what good. what uh the what 90s. summer blockbusters were mm. like the next one on the list feels a little bit more recently you know it um, does yeah in that yeah so that's deadpool wolverine yeah so like furiosa deadpool wolverine is rated r rated r movies you know they don't have truly the universal appeal because not you know the kids can't get into those movies and i think pg-13 is the best rating for a summer blockbuster to work because you're getting everybody uh, but Deadpool, Wolverine, you're right. We've talked countless times about superhero movies, superhero fatigue. Marvel has definitely hit the fatigue point. Um, but the Deadpool movies have always been like a beacon of hope. And Deadpool, Wolverine looks... I mean, I mean, uh, we just saw one trailer for this movie so far, but I am so into this movie. Yeah, we could have a big you know, extended Marvel conversation, but that's not what this show is about. I think that it is, I'm very excited that Marvel is comfortable taking a step back and just doing like, let's just do one movie this year. Mm -hmm. And And let's do it well. Yeah. And let's do it really well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. And that's, that's coming out in July. Um, And then we'll run really quickly through August. August tends to be the quieter month for movies, um, for big summer movies. But you have you have Borderlands. Borderlands is the uh, the adaptation of the video game Borderlands. It has a great cast. Uh, the movie feels really Guardians of the Galaxy to mm-hmm. me from what I saw from the first trailer. Which I mean, I'm in for that. I like that. Lock, yeah, sign me up. Yeah, it you know Fallout just ending is probably. Fallout and Last of Us are probably, in my opinion, the best that I've seen as far as um, adaptations from video games. Yeah, but I think a, I think a television format works better for I do too. video games. But Borderlands is such a dumb game anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, Super Mario Bros. did pretty good. It did. I mean, I'll see it. Um, we have Alien Romulus. This is a new Alien movie. Alien movies are, you know, they've been making these for, for decades now. Um, some are really memorable and good. Some are not. Some are um, Alien Prometheus, or was it just Prometheus? Prometheus, yeah, that that was weird. I was trying too hard to go deep into the the start of things. 
Um, Horizon Chapter 2 comes out in August. That's the part two of the Kevin Costner movie. And then the summer movie season ends Labor Day weekend with a movie that I'm very excited for, and that's Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Hold on. Oh, I thought you were going to oh, say I'm it. Not, no, three no. Three times. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Did you do it again? Beetlejuice. No. Okay, no. so now you no, said we're it good. five times. We're Luckily, good. if you say it five times, it, it <laughs> negates it. This movie looks fun. It's Michael Keaton returning. I. You want to talk about King of Camp? Oh, God. Michael Keaton is, yeah. uh, I, I mean, incredible. But uh, you have Winona Ryder returning. Um, you have, oh, God, what is her name from the show Wednesday? Her I was, name I always forget is... this actress's name. Her name is Jenna Ortega. Okay. Yes, Jenna Ortega, which is, I mean, come on. Jenna Ortega in a Tim Burton Beetlejuice sequel playing, I think, Lydia Dietz's daughter? Oh, wow. What? I think. I might be wrong, but that's what I gathered from the trailer. Yes, please. Um, I loved Beetlejuice. I will say that I go into this movie cautiously because Tim Burton, the master he was, the, the beautiful, incredible, visionary things that he's done has had a track record the past you know decade, two decades maybe, of not quite getting there. Um, so I, I hope that it's Tim Burton actually getting there again because Tim Burton back at his, his masterful craft would be a, a wonderful thing to, to see. I think Tim Burton not trying to appeal to everyone is the best Tim Burton. I think so. I think so. Keep it tight. Yep. Keep it tight, Tim. Keep it, Keep Timmy? it tight. Tim? Keep it tight. Keep it tight. Um, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, that comes out September 6th, and that concludes the summer blockbuster season. I think Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice would have been better to come out around Halloween, but I do also understand that uh, the movie viewing time and you know box office gain is a little better in September around you know a holiday weekend, so I understand it. I still would like to see this movie around Halloween. Is September 6th close enough to Halloween to make it feel right? I don't think so. I don't. I don't. I, don't I think so it's either. too far away. I think it still feels like summer. It's going to be warm. You know? Yeah. I agree. I don't know. Um, there's also a ton of great indie films coming out, like Sing Sing. Um, there, there's a new Beverly Hills Cop movie coming straight to streaming. There's a lot of other things coming out this summer, but we wanted to focus on this episode on some of the bigger things coming to movie theaters because the essence of a summer movie, as we talked about earlier, is seeing it in a movie theater. So, you know, let us know what your favorite summer blockbuster is. Um, and we're going to we're gonna be back next week, hopefully talking about Furiosa. If not, maybe even talking about prequels because this, this IndieWire review of Furiosa saying it maybe is the best prequel ever has me thinking a conversation about prequels that work and prequels that didn't. That sounds like something fun to talk about on Box Office Culture. So stay tuned. I'm, I'm sure we'll do that in the next couple of weeks. Again, I am Tony Nunes. Uh, <laughs> I'm pointing to Lee. I mean, the, the prompts here are just not working. There's a delay. So, yeah, we're in the same office, but we are 100 yards away from each other. Um, I'm Lee Metzger. Thanks for listening and watching the show. And we will be back next week here on Box Office Culture. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the United Theatre Podcast Network. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And if you could take a moment to leave a review, we greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us create content that you love. So hit that subscribe button and leave us a review, and we'll see you on the next episode.